My fellow stokers rubbed me mercilessly from time to time, for I was the baby among them. I didn't mind. They ribbed the little Japanese too till they discovered that, small though he was, he could shovel more coal than any of us. He was called Mikaya, but we all called him the little Mitch. And he was little, littler even than me. Maybe because we had fellow stowaways, or maybe because we were both about the same size, he became quite a friend. He spoke no English at all, so we conversed in gestures and smiles. We managed to make ourselves well enough understood. Like the rest of them, I was black from head to toe after every shift, but Captain Smith was true to his word. We were all well enough looked after. We had plenty of hot water to wash ourselves clean. We had all the food we could eat and a warm bunk to sleep in. I didn't go up on deck that much. It was a long way up and when I did, I had an hour or two off, I found myself I was just too tired to do anything much except sleep. Down there in the bowels of the ship, I didn't know if it was night or day and I didn't much care either. It was just work, sleep, eat, work, sleep, eat. I was too tired even to dream. When I did go up on deck, I looked out on a moonlit sea or a sunlit sea that was always as flat as a pond and shining. I never saw another ship, just the wide horizons. Occasionally there were birds soaring over the decks and once, to everyone's great excitement, we spotted dozens of leaping dolphins. I'd never known such beauty. Every time I went up on deck, though, I was drawn towards the first class of the ship. I'd stay there by the rail for a while, hoping against hope I might see Elizabeth coming walking by with Casper on his lead. But I never saw them. I thought of them, though, as I shoveled and sweated, as I lay in my bunk in between shifts, as I looked over the glassy sea. I kept trying to summon up the courage to climb over the railings and find my way back up again to their cabin. I longed to see the look of surprise on Elizabeth's face when she saw I was on board. I knew how pleased she'd be to see me, that Casper would swish his tail and smile up at me. But about Elizabeth's mother and father, I couldn't be at all sure. The truth is that I still believe they would think badly of me for stowing away as I had. I decided that it would be better to wait until we got to New York, and then I'd just go up to them and all surprise them on the quayside. I'd tell them there and then that I'd taken Elizabeth's advice and come to live in America, in the land of the free. They'd never need to know I'd stowed away. I was half sleeping, half dreaming in my bunk, dreaming that Casper was yowling at me, trying to wake me. We're in some kind of danger and he was trying to warn me. Then it happened. The ship suddenly shuddered and shook. I sat up. Right away it felt to me like some kind of collision and I could tell it had happened on the starboard side. A long silence followed. Then I heard a great rushing and roaring of escaping steam, like a death rattle. I knew that something had gone terribly wrong, that the ship had been wounded. The engines had stopped. Half a dozen of us got dressed at once and rushed up to the third deck, the boat deck. We all expected to see the ship we'd collided with because that was what we thought had happened. But we could see nothing, no ship, nothing but the stars and an empty sea all around. There was no one else on deck except us. It was as if no one else had felt it, as if it had all been a bad dream. No one else had woken so it followed that nothing had happened. I was almost beginning to believe I had imagined the whole thing when I saw little Mitch come rushing along the deck towards us carrying something in both hands. It was a huge piece of ice shaped like a giant tooth, jagged and sharp. He was shouting the same thing over and over again but I couldn't understand him. None of us could. Then one of the other stokers said it. Iceberg! It's off an iceberg! We've only gone and hit flaming iceberg! <laughs>